Welcome viewers. Amid the ongoing India-China standoff in Ladakh, an important development took place last week. Led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself, at least 20 union ministers and chief ministers from across the country wished His Holiness the Dalai Lama on his 86th birthday. To discuss the importance of this and much more, we have an important guest with us today. And that's President of the Tibetan Government in Exile, Pen Pa Shering. Welcome, sir. Many congratulations first for having taken over as the president of the new government after recently held elections. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Let me begin by asking on this very uh, important development, I would say, ha that has happened. I mean, this kind of outreach uh, has not been made in the recent times by the Indian establishment. How do you see this? Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister Modiji's uh, tweet uh, being made public. This is happening for the first time. But uh, this is not the first time that uh, the Prime Minister had uh, wished His Holiness on his birthday or on other occasions, including personal meetings. So for us uh, as Tibetans, um, uh, we don't see anything new in that. But uh, at the same time, now with technology and uh, the ways of communications changing from time to time, uh, I'm sure there must be a reason behind uh, Prime Minister making his tweet public. Uh, and uh, if there is, then I'm sure the message would have gone across to wherever it needs to go. Can you be more specific, sir, whom the message was meant for? <laughs> you, 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 uh, from the very beginning of this interview, you talked about the current uh, relations between India and China on the border issues. So definitely there is only one uh, party that needs to be addressed. And that is definitely China. I understand. I would ask, would that be, would then it be a natural corollary that there a, a meeting happens between Prime Minister and His Holiness? Yeah, His Holiness, as you know, has devolved his political and uh, administrative responsibilities since 2011. So his focus today, uh, as he has been doing uh, uh, for, for many decades, has been to uh, espouse on his commitments. Uh, the four commitments that he had made as a human being to promote moral values. And moral values are very much related with the ancient Indian wisdom uh, of which uh, we Tibetans have become a reservoir of part of ancient Indian knowledge, uh, particularly Buddhism. So that is uh, one issue. And the second, of course, uh, His Holiness has been concentrating on building inter-religious harmony because religion is supposed to right. bring succor, succor to people when they are not happy or when they are into difficulties. But uh, <clears throat> in today's time, uh, unfortunately, religious ha religion has become a dividing force within humanity. So His Holiness has always tried to bring uh, religious bodies together, different religious traditions, and uh, take initiatives in uh, creating right. better understanding between religious groups. And the third commitment is, of course, Tibet. Uh, for which even if he had yes. uh, devolved his political and administrative responsibilities, still as a Tibetan, yes. uh, he's yes. committed to the cause. And whenever uh, the need arises for His Holiness uh, intervention in terms of resolving Sino-Tibet conflict, I'm sure he will not shy away from this responsibility. And the fourth is, of course, uh, revival of uh, ancient Indian wisdom within India itself, because that is an art that is lost in India to learn about the ancient Indi Indian wisdom that are still right. very, very right. relevant today. You know, what Indians have been right. teaching right. and practicing uh, more than 2000 years ago is still very much relevant today. So that is, uh, so these four right. responsibilities, His yeah. Holiness continues to carry on. But at the same time, if there is a possible meeting between His Holiness and uh, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, uh, as usual, uh, I'm sure His Holiness will focus much more on uh, his uh, global responsibilities than just Tibet alone. Right. But uh, if the Indian government wants to bring Tibet uh, in the agenda uh, or the border on the agenda, right. I'm sure there will be opportunities to discuss about this. Sure. I mean, let's discuss a little more on Tibet, sir. I mean, I have some few questions. Uh, uh, we saw the Chinese <coughs> protesting uh, when some Tibetans were uh, marking His Holiness birthday at Demchok. I mean, the reports came in that the Chinese sort of uh, uh, protested against it. Uh, 
I mean, what kind of message are the Chinese sending the Tibetan community if they do things like that? I don't know. You have to tell me or we have to ask the Chinese because on one hand, they are so concerned about the reincarnation of the 14th Dalai Lama, uh, the 15th Dalai Lama. And uh, at the same time, uh, they don't, uh, you know, care about or they don't, they try to always uh, victimize uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, which is current and still living. So they, they care more about the unborn 15th Dalai Lama than the living 14th Dalai Lama. So it's, it's quite a paradox as to uh, what to make of it. But of course, uh, uh, the Chinese government uh, always trying to use repressive measures or uh, interfering in whatever the Tibetans do. Whatever we do is negative for them. They don't see it any, anywhere positive. So that's very unfortunate. Yeah. If, the, if the issue needs to be resolved, then they have to listen to the Tibetans. Well, you recently commented, uh, and I'm reading from that comment, that China cannot win moral power through force. You just mentioned that uh, China is using repressive measures, perhaps like Xinjiang in Tibet as well. Can you just elaborate a bit on that? Well, the Chinese leadership has been talking about uh, harmony within the nationalities, uh, that is domestic issues, whether it's the Han Chinese or the Tibetans or Uyghurs or Mongols or Nyingxia people. So on the one hand, they talk about harmony within the nation. They talk about harmony with its neighboring countries. They talk about harmony in international relations. But on the other hand, what they physically do or what they actually implement is always on the contrary. So their words and actions don't meet. Uh, that is where the problem lies. If they are really sincere, sincere about uh, creating a harmonious society, a global harmonious society, then they have to uh, lead by example, by creating better relations with all its neighbors, uh, including India or its neighbors in the South China Sea or East China in Japan or Taiwan, or its relation with the United States or Europe. So, but that, that does not seem to be happening. So it is uh, what they are saying and what they are doing are two different things, which are very unfortunate. Would you, would you also want to kind of address the global community? Because the Tibetan issue, the issue of Tibet by itself seems a little <coughs> headlined. For example, President Joe Biden, when he addressed the G7 summit and the statement came out, he mentioned uh, Xinjiang, he mentioned Taiwan, but Tibet was conspicuous by its absence. Uh, the Tibet uh, is very much on the agenda, but as uh, it happens with many other causes, uh, sometimes you have you get more leverage, sometimes you get le less leverage. Right now, there is much more repression inside Uyghur, so there are mo much more testimonies. There's mu there are much more reporting from those areas, so the world community uh, understands what's happening, and they are concerned and they express their <clears throat> concern. So, with the Tibetan issue. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the reality of the situation continues to be the same. The crisis continues within Tibet. All the policies and programs of the Chinese government are aimed at eradicating the Tibetan national identity, which includes uh, religion, which includes language, uh, culture, way of life, uh, the, including the environment. Can you, can you elaborate with some examples? Can you elaborate with examples? <clears throat> like how are they attacking the Tibetan culture and identity there? Now, we all, we all know that the, uh, the basis of a culture or an identity lies in its language. And uh, we derived our language from India. Uh, it's very uh, different from Chinese language. Now, in terms of language, starting from Mao's time, and then there was, you know, Mao's time was very, very bad for us. You, you witness cultural revolution, everything. After Mao died, Deng Xiaoping was a little more liberal. Hu Yaobang visited Tibet. So in the 80s, for several years, there was some relaxation uh, within which Pension Rinpoche was also released and he took the responsibility of revival of Tibetan language and other things. Then, you know, starting from Chiang Zemin to Hu Jintao to now present uh, President Xi Jinping, the, the issue of Tibetan language has been reduced to just one language class in all the Tibetan schools, even if they claim that it's a dual language system. Uh, so even if you study yeah. Tibetan, are, are you don't get jobs. Are you teaching Mandarin to the, to the Tibetan children and uh, oh, yes. not uh, the language you, that their your ancestors oh, yes. uh, grew up with? Yeah, yeah. The Mandarin has become the medium of language today. So if you don't study uh, Mandarin, you don't get uh, jobs. If you study Tibetan, you, you don't get jobs. The official languages are all in Mandarin. And uh, not just inside Tibet, which is occupied territory, 
but uh, they have started teaching That's Mandarin right. and all the uh, neighboring countries or that borders with China or Tibet. In fact, in fact, there are reports that uh, uh, it's in, it's become sort of mandatory for the Tibetan homes in Tibet uh, to keep posters of Xi Jinping there. Some kind of Xi Jinping thought being ingrained in the next generation there. Yeah, but that's also an ironical statement because uh, Chinese leadership does not believe in uh, uh, idol worship or any of those sorts, uh, anything religious or spiritual. But at the same time, what Xi Jinping is doing today or the leadership in Tibet is doing today is putting up as many postures of Xi Jinping as possible so that he needs to be revered and respected as a spiritual leader. And one of the Tibetan also who has been indoctrinated by the Chinese uh, said that Xi Jinping is my spiritual leader uh, in jest. So, uh, right. yeah, this is an right. irony. China recently came out with a white paper, sir. I think they keep doing that after every decade or so. <clears throat> now, I could see two strands while going through it. One was mm. that it seems that they are saying that they have developed Tibet with a lot of money, financial muscle, a lot of infrastructure. Now, they should be focusing on religion and uh, sort of uh, developing religion in Tibet in a, with Chinese characteristics. I mean, what is your understanding from what's happening on the ground? So, when you, uh, do you believe when China say that uh, communism or market economy with Chinese characteristics, so everything they want to change, they always put a Chinese char characteristics behind that and make sure that all their pro policies and programs are imposed on the people. Uh, that is very unfortunate because so far what they have done is taken development to a level where you feel that, okay, through development, you can resolve all of the issues or any of the issues. But unfortunately, they right. fail to realize the real aspiration of the people, whether it's to do with the Tibetans right. or the Uyghurs or the Mongols. The real aspiration of the people is to preserve their national identity, and which is also the right. role and responsibility of the ruler who does that. So if right. you it, it, right. take the case right. of India, you have a diversity of uh, languages, you have a diversity of religion, but you can still live in right. peaceful harmony, whereas China tries to impose everything communist. So when they say religion with uh, Buddhism, with uh, Chinese characteristics, that would also include, uh, I'm sure, all the things that they want, because they want uh, the power to recognize reincarnation of lamas. Yes. If they don't believe in life after death, how can they how, the, how can they recognize reincarnated lamas? Because it's basically up to the individual lama as to where they want to be born and how they want to be born. Right. That, that, that brings me to the second aspect of this white paper, which is about mm. reincarnation, actually. Uh, the paper mm. seems to suggest that they do not want to negotiate with the Dalai Lama any further, that they would want to control the process of uh, reincarnation, so to say, of the successor of Dalai Lama. Because they know they, they, they have to use it for political purposes. And everybody in the world knows about this. Uh, why China is doing this, even though they don't believe in religion. So that is why His Holiness also says in jest, no, if China is really very, very concerned about the reincarnation issues, first they should look for Mao Zedong's reincarnation. Second, Deng Xiaoping's reincarnation. Right. Then maybe the Dalai Lamas. Right. So uh, on an authority which does not justify uh, uh, with uh, 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 reason, uh, then uh, th there's no right. way it can go forward, even though they try, even though they might try to impose a Dalai Lama on the Tibetans, uh, just as they experienced right. with the recognition right. of the selection of uh, Panchen Lama, it will be the same issue. Panchen Nobody Lama. will respect yes, that. So you are making it very clear that you are not going to respect or the Tibetan community around the world is not going to respect the choice made by the no Chinese. Way. No way, no way. It's not possible. I come to my second last question now. You've mm. just taken over as the head of the government after elections. Is there some roadmap in your mind vis-a-vis -vis the <clears> Indian <throat> government? Like, for example, citizenship for Tibetans uh, post-1987, born post-1987? Now, those are issues that will need uh, further examination from the Tibetan side as well uh, as uh, uh, the Indian government. So, the, these are uh, issues. In my case also, I always say, uh, is it wise to take Indian citizenship? You know, if all the Tibetans take up Indian citizenship, what would be the case with His Holiness the Dalai Lama? 
Will His Holiness also take Indian citizenship? If that is the case, then what would be the message for the Tibetans inside Tibet? That His Holiness has also taken citizenship. Tibetans, other Tibetans have also taken citizen. Of course, Tibetans who go out of India, they have no other choice but to take other nationalities. Uh, but we also have the freedom right. to still work for our cause. Uh, that is there. Right. And Indian government also have been very, very benevolent and very, very uh, kind hearted to us uh, from the time we came here. So we remain, remain ever grateful to Indian government. But there are also certain policy issues that we need to be very, very careful about, uh, you know, thinking of future consequences as to what these actions could right. mean. But of course, we don't stop individual right. Tibetans from right. doing anything uh, that are uh, eligible, that are legally available for them to do. My last question, sir. Hmm. Last year, in this, during the standoff with China in Ladakh, one Tibetan soldier of the Special Frontier Force laid down his life defending the borders of India. <clears throat> what is the sentiment you get from the Tibetan youth in India and particularly in Tibet? Now, this, uh, I was asked another question uh, when uh, the Chinese government plans to recruit more Tibetans on the other side of the border to fight with the border areas here. So while they also recognize the fact that Tibetans are fighting on the border, and this is this uh, sacrifice is not the first time. Tibetans have been involved in the uh, Bangladesh war. Tibetans have been in involved with the Kargil war. And now that it has become much more visible, uh, the social media talks about SFF and how it was founded and all those things. And this was one of the latest sacrifices by the Tibetans. and. Uh, uh, it's very emotional uh, for the Tibetans also to be part of, uh, to, to be able to repay India back in some sense of the, all the hospitality that has been granted to us. And uh, his anniversary, his death anniversary is coming next month on August 30. And we'll be creating a small statue for him in Dharamsala and commemorate that not just for him, uh, for protecting Indian people, but also for the number of Tibetans who have sacrificed their life in Bangladesh war and Kargil war and now what is happening here. So we are also, uh, yeah, in one way, this is uh, this can be considered as an uh, uh, Guru Dakshina for India for providing us all the hospitality, even though we lost our life, but that is part of uh, our responsibility also. Well, great sentiments uh, on that note. I would bring you to an end this interview and I hope uh, the plain speaking you have done uh, reaches the right quarters and more importantly, the Chinese listen to it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Abhishek.